All right, good evening, everybody. So we are continuing our lecture series. This is be our third lecture. Uh, on our last one, we went through kind of some of the the background of, of Greek philosophy. Just obviously, it was a very you know overview of certain things, key figures that ultimately um, had influence on on the early church, and pretty much kind of helped provide a a framework for our doctrine of God. So. Now we're going to be getting into the the apostolic fathers, the the early church fathers, and, and and going through their their thought development. And obviously, it's going to be something that we see as we go through father to father, and we move closer and closer to our our modern time. We're going to see this development of doctrine. So, um, but yeah, before we get started, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time to to be uh, sharing. Lord, and thank you for those that want to hear and hear about your church, to hear about the men and women that you've raised up um, and you've given them insight and you just helped shape our Christian doctrine of you, of Christ, of the Trinity, of all these precious truths, Lord. And so continue to bless us and guide us in our time, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I first initially wrote wrote out all this stuff, I, I start off using a lot of sources for the, for the history and a lot of secondary sources on on the early church fathers and i mean i read the primary as well but i kind of was giving a little bit more to the historical piece to help kind of create this backdrop so so as what, what you're going to see is that is that the, the the initial the initial part of the lecture we're going to be hearing some background about what was going on and it's important because we want to always understand the context of whoever we're studying uh what, what's going on that kind of thing so but what's going to happen is you'll see as i get more into the anti-nicene fathers I pretty much go primary sources only. So basically what you are listening to is my exposition of, of reading of reading directly what they wrote. And, and I, I wanted to go that route because, you know, if I just stick to secondary sources as good as they are and helpful, and at times I do look to them with certain things, um, I'm getting them. And then I'm going to give you a third, a tertiary source, right? It's, it's going to be me trying to, in a sense, explain and exposit what... Lewis Ayer says about Tertullian and that kind of thing. So um, now again, obviously these guys are experts in the field and I would, obviously I got them, I read them, I would tell you to also read them, but I want to keep you as close to the primary text as possible. And also too, it's just a, a good way to really understand, um, you know, what the early church fathers taught on the doctrine of God. And that's another thing too. So when, when you're reading a, a secondary source, remember there's going to be an angle or a perspective that that author is, is looking to get as he's reading these primary sources, just like I have. Like so, so my my uh, agenda is that I am I am combing through the early church fathers, looking for the specific aspects that pertain to the doctrine of God, the Trinity, the divine essence, uh, understanding how that language developed, how the doctrine developed, and so. In a sense, I'm not reading them like I'm reading a novel, right? Which you kind of don't always do anyways. But I'm reading them and I'm also scanning. So I'm looking for certain words. I'm looking for certain things. Then I stop there. I mean, I'm reading it all. But I'm not intently reading everything until I get to those key things. And so I go and I make, I underline everything that I read. And then I go back and I just slowly go through it. And I'm just kind of building, a, you know, building an exposition, if you will, of each particular church fathers. And so... Um, but but before we get started, real quick, so the question is, you know, first thing I know is who are the who are the early church fathers? Um, the terms apostolic fathers, uh, anti-Nicene fathers, post-Nicene fathers. So uh, those are important terms, and those are basically just obviously about uh, chronology, right? Chronology during the times of when the early church started and when it kind of kept moving forward. So the apostolic fathers are those who are basically within the time after the the the, the apostles. Had passed away somewhere around 70 AD to about 1 150 AD I think would be kind of where it's at to where these are guys that like sat at the feet or they were closest to the New Testament times and so what's going on now is that the early church of the, the sorry the church but the the apostles have passed away right the church is going the apostles are no longer here so now there's a call to leaders there's a call to bishops there's a call to pastors obviously they're no longer inspired they're no longer given revelation but there's issues that need to be settled. There's there's doctrinal disputes. There's false teachings coming in, right? All these things that the the apostles told us to expect were going to come. So now, the church has to start establishing, excuse me, establishing doctrine to defend the truth, to to keep away those that want to try to bring down, obviously the uh, the church, if you will. So, um, 
again, obviously we're not going to spend a lot of time on, on the on history, but I am going to run through just kind of a, a brief background of what's kind of going on and the kind of kind of context that we need to get into. So, um, yeah, let's get started. So, so the transition into the second century posed great challenges for the church and the competing philosophy and cultural milieu of the time. So the question was, how do Jerusalem and Athens align? That's a common question that uh, you will see uh, if you've not read it already in other studies. Uh, what, what hap what's, what's to happen with Jerusalem and Athens? And the whole point is Jerusalem obviously being the, the, the New Testament times and the Athens being the, the, the symbol of, of Greek, a Greek uh, culture, Greek milieu, the Greek philosophy, and that kind of thing. How does, how does the Bible and philosophy align? How can these competing views become compatible? Should they mingle together? So, so a new body of doctrine becomes this guiding revelation for second century Christians. But there's more work to be done in light of the church's identity, being that uh, because of Christ, it's, it's an affirmation that there's only one God who is the Father of Jesus Christ, who is also God of God. Right? So there's this, this teaching that's not fully developed yet that is starting to kind of get attention because why there's people coming in here saying, you're worshiping Christ, but there's only one God. It makes you polytheist, right? But we're monotheists. So there's a body of doctrine that ultimately needs to be developed for this. So while philosophers argued for the sake of arguing, early Christians were in a hostile environment and had much more at stake, the health of the church and their eternal lives. The Christian religion did not have the appearance reflective of the surrounding philosophy that it quickly developed in. Because of its uncompromised commitment to the Bible, it had greater organization and coherency as a religion compared to the pagan religions it rubbed shoulders with. However, Christian doctrine developed through an incorporation of Platonic ideas, providing it as a, a substance metaphysic, right? We've been talking about that. We went through um, some basic views of, of Platonic philosophy and Aristotelian philosophy, but these Platonic ideas gave uh, a, subst a substance metaphysic, excuse me, that aided the church in constructing its doctrine of God. Christianity thus became a philosophy, but but unlike the philosophers, and the philosophers were these group of guys that were would come together and they have dialogue and, and basically they were kind of kind of a bunch of crazy guys I guess that, that would be said about them. But so so we're, they weren't like these guys, right? The Christians weren't like these guys, but however, they were first and foremost. Oh, excuse me, first and foremost, they were Christians. They weren't just the philosophers, but. Christianity became a philosophy, right? Obviously, it is the wisdom. It's that Christians should be lover of wisdom, as, as philosophy means, because that's what God has given us. But so they, they use the tools of philosophy for the sake of consistency and coherency in expositing the scriptures and what it teaches about God uh, as the church faced all these heretical oppositions that were, that were claiming to be biblical, right? But they ultimately were promoting aberrant views of Christ and God. Christians committed to the authority of Scripture use what aligned with their convictions as derived from the Scriptures, making Christian philosophy, in fact, a Christian theology. The early Christian fathers primarily adopted aspects of contemporary philosophy to address the skeptics of their time, using it as a tool for evangelism, the handmaiden of theology. Right? We think about Paul uh, in Athens, right? About he's, He wants to talk to these guys and share this new philosophy, but he's there and he makes this, um, you know, uh, not simulation, not simulation, what's the word? Um, <laughs> I can't I can't remember my words. But anyways, he, he's making a he's making a comparison that that we all worship, right? We all worship. There is a God, and so they have this 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 uh sign to the unknown God, right? And he uses the opportunity to to evangelize. And so ultimately that's what we have here is the is the way of getting into these different aspects of the of the surrounding culture, right? And so this understanding of Greek philosophy you know, became a tool to support theology and to show them ultimately that their philosophy is going to dead end somewhere, right? But ultimately used properly. So the abstract terms of philosophy, such as impassibility, immutability, and comprehensibility, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, and so on, uh, these provided a manner of speaking intelligibly about how God could become man, yet also be God. Now the Gentile philosophers, they had a view of reality as the ta'ons, the Greek word that means that which is, a supreme impersonal being, right? Obviously, that's why their philosophy was bankrupt. But to defend, the, to defend the God of the Bible, the church fathers established that God is transcendent, right, from Scripture, transcendent, yet personal. Not that which is, but rather ha'on, 
which means he who is. Ha'an. So you have ta'an, that which is, which is obviously wrong, and ha'an, he who is. And what is that? It's an infinitely greater view and better view of ultimate reality. The supreme being of the cosmos made flesh in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Gnosticism was a, a threat to the early church, and we're not going to get into a whole lot of, of Gnostic teaching. If you want to read about it, um, Irenaeus provides the, I think the, the, the greatest source of what Gnosticism was about. It's very weird. Um, I, I couldn't get through it. It's very boring. You may have interest in it, so if you want to read all about Gnosticism, uh, check out Irenaeus' work. You can get it online. It's, again, it's open, open, or open access or public, public domain. Something like that. So anyways, but however, very strange it was, it actually was a great threat to the early church. Now, the differences weren't about language, right? It was about a worldview issue. So the early Christians saw God as the transcendent creator. Gnostics saw God as a, a distance, unattached, unattached negation to the world. Right? So there was a very unhistorical way of seeing things, very syncretistic, right? Which means they use all kinds of weird different things, right? And it was, it was a philosophy, right? There was nothing about faith. There was nothing about um, uh, true knowledge, right? It was, it was an outlandish way of saying that there was a higher level of knowing something. So ultimately very, very strange. Now, one thing I didn't cover is that of where we're going to go. So we're going to cover the um, some key figures. Now, one thing I didn't I didn't preface. So with with how I'm going to be working through everything, I'm not going to cover every single uh, figure in the early church. It just it's too much. Um, but I'm going to cover again. I'm covering key people that spoke about these doctrines, where you can see the doctrine of God develop. So and again, there's so much stuff written in Latin that I can't read, unfortunately. I didn't take Latin. I tried to uh, on top of everything else, but just couldn't get through it. But anyway, so I'm only going to be reading kind of key figures. And it's going to, as you see, I'm going to be continuing to, uh, as we get into the Antinicene Fathers, there's a lot more there. So the Apostolic Fathers, I'm covering just a couple real quick. And then we'll get into, obviously, later on some um, some big hitters. But I'm pretty much going to cover up to, um, through Irenaeus. And then once we get past Irenaeus, he's on the Antinicene side. Um, there's a lot to go through. So anyway, so let me continue. Sorry about that. So Valentinus was a Gnostic, probably the most famous of the Gnostics, uh, that was closest to Orthodox Christianity. He proposed an emanation theory that suggested that God's being is developed out of a primal, mysterious unity into a series they call them aeons, or ions, A-E-O-N-S, collectively called the Pleroma, or the fullness of the Godhead. So, he, so God emanated, right? So from God arrived this incomplete conception of himself, right? And he continued to emanate himself to everything around. Now, this process that Valentinus talks about, it repeats itself, becoming a series of powers that are actually other beings that that he has imparted himself to. So almost like what comes from him. So a Jesus would be a being that's that that's that comes from him. It's kind of we're just thinking of the sun giving out rays, right? So God is this this large sun, right? And basically he's just, um, uh, what's the word? Imparting himself to all creatures around us. And eventually when those creatures die, they go back and they get absorbed into, into God. So, uh, very strange. Um, but yeah. So our first, our first, uh, apostolic father we're going to look at here is Ignatius of Antioch. So just some background about him. So he died around 107 AD, right? So very, very early. And he was the apostolic father that was thought to be closest to the new testament he wrote seven letters uh, while in route under armed guard to rome as he suffered martyrdom uh, these letters were to churches and cities throughout which he which he passed them around philadelphia smyrna and to the churches um, that were in those areas also uh, ephesus trales and magnesia uh, he sent a letter ahead to the church in rome to prevent their intervention with the roman authorities and delivering him from his martyrdom Right, he didn't want that to happen. He thought, "I'm going to die as my Savior died," um, but ultimately he was um, what's it called? He was martyred for his faith. So we're going to read a little bit what he kind of brought to the table. And real quick, if you don't have this book, um, it's a book here called um, "The Apostolic Fathers," plain and simple. And it's Greek text and English translation. So on one side it has the Greek, on the other side it has the English. And so this is all their letters. Uh, very, very interesting. And again. You know, remember, so when you're reading these reading these guys, too, we have to remember, we want to keep them in their context. They weren't 
professors, right? They didn't sit down and put together this, this long teaching and have very organized and structured. They're writing letters to these churches trying to deal with sin, trying to deal with just the issues of the age, obviously trying to flee from persecution, dealing with false teaching. So this isn't a very systematized, organized manner of teaching. So sometimes you read this stuff and it sounds kind of, I don't know, maybe kind of out there, but I don't mean out there like it's bad. It just, you, you realize it's not, it wasn't something that was carefully thought about to sit down in a classroom and teach. All right, Ignatius of Antioch. So Ignatius of Antioch from the second century faced opposition by Christian docetists who taught that Christ only seemed to suffer, right? That that comes from the Greek word to think or to appear. It seems like he was, right? So they say he didn't really suffer because the true God is eternal and cannot die, right? So we have this conflict here between the Father, right? The, uh, the God of the cosmos and the man, Jesus Christ. Again, so here's the conflict coming out right out of the gate right away, right? So to maintain Christ's humanity and his deity, thus by all means a paradoxical position, Ignatius establishes a third step in the Christian doctrine of God to express and maintain the incarnation. So this third step is that Christ is eternal, invisible, and impassable, yet he is human, visible, and suffered, and died on the cross. I mean, that sounds pretty straightforward. We, we remember, But remember, too, we can see that going back to the text. We know that going into the early New Testament... Uh, that these are clear doctrines, right? But remember, this stuff is just starting. We're starting now to engage. Now there's actually people coming to, tur coming to the church, excuse me, trying to discredit the, the resurrection and discredit who Jesus is. So the church before Ignatius' time, uh, in the church before Ignatius' time, such language had currently been used in regard to God the Father, but now is being applied to Christ the Son, the Son of God, Christ as God. So Again, in the New Testament, there are these passages we go to that speak of Christ as being God. But now it's like, okay, there's some real opposition. And we need to start now formulating doctrine to combat uh, this false teaching and also to what to preserve the true gospel that the apostles have now handed on to us, right? So the incarnation was not just a story. It had ethical, theological, and metaphysical imp implications, but the problem of one God was a serious obstacle in that for the Christian story to make sense as a coherent body of true, revealed teaching, the story of salvation, the story of creation to recreation, with Christ as a center, the claim of one God, one God as Father and Son, and one God as first principle, needed to be reconciled. There's a lot of statements there, but again... These are all things that there's little fingers about, there's little streams of thought about that now need to be all brought together, okay, into a coherent body of Christian theology. And this was the first task. It was to properly order and structure, and structure Christian theology. So the early Christian response to the question of its God as the starting point in physics, logic, and ethics, right, these were also things that were seen in other philosophies, but the Christian perspective saw that God is the monarchia, right, the sole ruler of all, and that kept them aligned with the Old Testament's doctrine of God. Now, Greek thought understood history and cycles. The Old Testament and New Testament taught that there is one timeline with a, with a beginning and an end governed by God. It is the monarchia, right? It's the, the monarch. Think of the, the ruler, the king. So the monarchial view of God as a sole ruler. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And the first understandings of Christ was that he was either subordinate to the Father or that he eclipsed the Father, right? So again, the monarchy means there's one head. Where does Christ fit in that? So they thought either one, he was subordinate to him, which we know is wrong, right? Or now he overclips the Father, or sorry, overclips. He eclipses the Father. But both concepts, as we know, are insufficient. But at some level, they made the sense, but at some level made sense of the biblical account and thus we have the emergence of a, a nascent Christian theology. Nascent means new. Sorry for the, the $5,000 word, right? But nascent Christianity. So what we do see is the apostolic fathers were committed to monotheism, by which they confessed that God is the true and only God. The God of the Bible it is, right? And as the apologists of the faith, as they refer to, these are going to be some other later guys that, that come out after the, apost ap after the apostolic fathers. They call them the apologists, right? Because they're now they're coming out to defend the faith and to expand it and to deal with all this, um, all this you know false teaching coming in. We need these apologists, right? But the apologists 
of the faith, they held to the doctrine of divine transcendence and the absolute monarchy of God. These two things were of primary importance. So emphasis on these aspects, along with the free sovereignty of God, arose due to the challenge and the threat of polytheistic and pantheistic teachings. That kind of becomes our next phase after the, the apostolic period. Well, I mean, they're still, they're still kind of part of that, but really they, they move into an own, their own class, if you will. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this following statement from the Shepherd of Hermas, which is a, a second century writing, encapsulates the foundation of the second century Christian doctrine of God. So it's kind of like a, a creed, if you will, or a confession from the Shepherd of Hermas. It says, God is one who created all things and set them in order <clears throat> and made out of what did not exist everything that is and who contains all but is himself alone uncontained. There's a lot in that statement, right? But, but here's, here's an important thing. We're talking about the early church, and this was a statement that they already knew. They already understood. They understood this is how it had to be, that the scriptures taught this, taught us of this God, right? But now it becomes now we have to systematize it. We have to now develop doctrine that takes all of scripture, all of about the world, and makes it a coherent body of knowledge that we can continue to be teaching and preaching and obviously defending as well. So... Again, like I said, we're not going to go through a very long, um, detailed examination of the Apostolic Fathers, but just continue on into our, our, our uh, the few that we have. So the next one is going to be kind of our, our, our last one of the Apostolic Era. Again, there were more, but the last one we're going to look at, but we're going to get into um, other key, key teachers as well that started to develop it further. So here's Clement of Rome. He died around 100 AD. He was a priest and bishop in Rome who wrote a letter to the church at Corinth around 96, probably considered one of the earliest writings outside the New Testament. Uh, Dionysus of Corinth around 170 was the first to name Clement as the author of that letter. Uh, Origen, an Alexandrian theologian, which we'll get to as well. And Eusebius, the first church historian, identified the writers Clement listed in the Shepherd of Hermas, which we just quoted from. So uh, more things about him. Um, yeah, that's about it. Okay, I thought I had more about him. But anyways... All right, so Clement of Rome. So <clears throat> I quote this from him. It's a confessional formula that he says. He says, Have we not one God and one Christ and one spirit of grace that was shed upon us? Right? That is the question. Have we not one God, one Christ, and one spirit? So what does that mean? So God as creator is one of the chief designations used in reverence to the God of the Bible. And when the Apostolic Fathers speak of him as creator... It is clear that the basic foundation to the doctrine of ex nihilo, creatio ex nihilo, is assumed. And what is that? It's the sense that God made out of what did not exist everything that is. And that's an important doctrine that, unfortunately, today, as it was at this time, oops, excuse me, as it was at this time, is on the chopping block. Actually, I just wrote a paper uh, evaluating a new contemporary model of creation whereby God creates out of what he's already created. So it sounds like, what? So yeah, so God of love, the loving God creates life out of things he's already created. But yet, yet, created matter has not always been around. But God has been everlastingly creating. Sounds crazy, but you know, I guess it sounds crazy as, it's, it's on the same level as crazy as the idea of, of God creating everything from nothing. But again, it's a worldview issue. It's a view of God that's brought into that view. But anyways, I'm not going to get into it. Um, I wrote a paper on it. Hopefully it's published. <laughs> Hopefully it does, and I'll share it with you guys. But anyway, so, but here at this time, it is a basic foundation that is assumed, right? That God made everything that out of what did not exist. Now, when we say that God made out of, yeah, that God made God created everything that, from what didn't exist. doesn't mean that there was nothing and there was something, but it's that God created from himself. He created through himself. There's nothing outside of God that he needed to create. And that's what we mean by creation ex nihilo, right? Because think about it. We engage with um, um, atheists, right? That we tell them that they believe in this big bang, right? And we say, what's the law of biogenesis? The law of biogenesis is that only life can come from life. Life doesn't come from non-life. That's absurd. So if we say that the same way that life came from nothing, as if nothing existed, no matter, that is kind of absurd. So we have to refine our language and properly articulate 
Creation ex nihilo means that God created from himself. There's nothing outside of him, nothing God needed. There was no additional materials. He created from himself. He gave being, B-E-I-N-G, he gave being to everything that's around us. That comes from him. So, such language reflected the common Judean Christian teaching in the second century. Clement's doctrine of divine simplicity, right? Now, again, simplicity is a, a, is a anachronistic term. They didn't say simplicity is a doctrine at this time. But, again, we're looking at how it develops. We're looking at these terms that start to develop in, in through the Christian teaching, through Christian theology and philosophy, and to uh, greater, greater provide, gosh, provide for us a greater and consistent body of doctrine about this stuff. So, anyway, so, say it again. Clement's doctrine of divine simplicity is grounded on the uniqueness and unity of God. This is what he writes. He says, How can that be expressed, which is neither genus, nor difference, nor species, nor individual, nor number, nay more, is neither an event, nor that to which an event happens? No one can rightly express him wholly. Obviously, he's speaking about God. For on account of his greatness, he is ranked as the all and is the father of the universe. Nor are any parts to be predicated of him. Now, predicate is a word that you'll see a lot, especially in our type of language that we're the, the, the philosophical language, predication, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a philosophical term, but basically it's saying that there's nothing that belongs to him, nor, nor are any parts to be predicated of him. To say that there's anything that, that, that sticks to him, that's a, that's a part of him, that he is who he is of himself. There's nothing parts that belong to God. He says here, for the one is indivisible. Therefore, also it is infinite, not considered with reference to inscrutability, but with reference to its being without dimensions and not having a limit. And therefore, it is without form and name. So again, it's kind of a clunky kind of kind of statement. Again, I'm pulling this from the, 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 the early translation of this from a long time ago. So actually, I think I pulled it from the version I have on Logos. This one here is a little bit more up to date, if you will. It's kind of, kind of awkward, but you can hear what he's saying, right? That God is not in a category of being, right? He can't be expressed. He's neither of a genus, right? If he's a genus, that means that mankind is now labeling God in a category. But he's beyond that. He's not a species, right? He's not an individual. He's not a number. He's not an event, right? That's kind of, he's not, not some kind of impersonal event that happened, right? He says, no one can rightly express him wholly. And that is the most important truth that we have to understand as we talk about God is that he is incomprehensible, right? Nobody can, can rightly express him wholly. And that's why he is great, right? That's why he is all in all. That's why he is simple. That's why there can't be any parts predicated of him. Because then if we think of parts to God, we are now talking about him in creaturely, creaturely terms. He is one, indivisible. And it's fascinating that they, at this time in the game, they understood that God is one and he's indivisible. Now, we, ha we have obviously the Old Testament, right? The, the, the Shema, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, which we see Paul talk about in, later on in 1 Corinthians 8, right? But he's indivisible. So there was a, again, the indivisibility we're talking about is a, is a metaphysical understanding, which we, again, we see this. This is the, the, helpful, the helpful metaphysics that comes from Greek philosophy. But here it's already being applied and being used so we can have a greater understanding to say what God is not, right? We're safe for saying what God is not, not what he is. And he's infinite, right? And therefore, he says, it is without form and name. And so the it here is that we're talking about the divine essence. It's the essence of God that we don't know what it is, right? We can't say that. We have no idea. We can say what God is not and what he's like, but we don't know actually this divine essence. Again, God is spirit. What is that exactly? You know, you know obviously now in our in our bodied forms here, in our in where that we have sin sin in front of our face and we're limited, you know, we can't fully understand that, nor will we ever fully understand it. Uh, but God ultimately is going to um, reveal to us further as in our glorified states with him. But until then, this is what we got. Anyways, okay. So for Clement, nothing is antecedent to the unbegotten. So what is antecedent? And that's a word that you should know as well. Antecedent is something that comes before, right? So I know that you may have heard us when we're preaching, right? We talk about we're reading a passage. We say we're, we're speaking about something and it says, who is the antecedent? So basically the antecedent is who's the one being referenced in that sentence, in that statement. So if I'm saying something and I, I say, if I say, Jesus, Jesus, right? And then I say the next sentence, he is Lord, 
to say who is the antecedent, so who is the one this is re referring to, because he obviously is a is a pronoun, but it's indefinite, right? Who is the he? The antecedent is Jesus that's being spoken of. So, so here he's talking about the divine essence and saying there's nothing is antecedent to the unbegotten. God is, right? God is. He is unbegotten. And the unbegotten, the Logos, right, was made flesh as our Lord Christ. <clears throat> the Cle and Clement writes, This Logos is the cause of all good things as the first efficient cause of motion. Now again, that language we read, what, what's that language from? It's from uh, Greek philosophy. Again, this is the stuff that we're using that's that's a handmaiden to our theology, not 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 driving our theology, it's the handmaiden to support these statements that we derive that we derive from the text. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Christ, Christ, sorry, Clement's philosophical framework understands that God does not have a physical body, even though Scripture uses terms that denote God's standing, sitting on his throne, using his right hand, his right arm, or moving, right? That's anthropomorphic language. So, and while scripture designates these terms to God, this is back to Clement, he says the first cause is not then in space, in space, but above both space and time and name and conception, right? He's incomprehensible. He's, if he's everywhere present, that means he's nowhere not. <laughs> so anyways, likewise, the son of God, having the same essence as the father, Clement writes, is never displaced is not being divided, not severed, not passing from place to place, being always everywhere and being contained nowhere, complete mind, the complete paternal light, all eyes, seeing all things, hearing all things, knowing all things, and by his power, sorry, his power, scrutinizing all powers. It's a pretty intense statement. A lot of rich theology there, a lot of, a lot of statements. Again, these are just things that we are just thinking through, right? Is that what are the implications of God and how can we speak of them and speak about him in the language that we have? All right, so I'm going to move now into the, the anti-Nicene Fathers. So the anti-Nicene Fathers now is we've kind of moved out of the apostolic period. The, the apostles have died. Those that were nearest to the New Testament, they have now continued to move doctrine forward. And now we're getting to what's called the anti-Nicene. Now the anti-Nicene, obviously, it basically means those fathers that became that came before uh, Nicaea, right? So the Council of Nicaea 325, that was a pivotal time in the church where obviously our doctrines of God were hammered out. So from 318 to 381 is that period, but the Council of Nicaea was 325. And so even though there was a council, right, there was further development that came out of that. So so in, in, the, in, the, in the Nicene, Council of Nicaea, everybody should know that, right? So 325. So this was summoned by uh, the Emperor Constantine to, to basically to kind of to, to hammer out some key things, right? So this is our first ecumenical council that was, uh, you know, all the bishops that were around were brought into here to really hammer out two things, right? Two things. So obviously there was the Arian controversy, which was a huge issue because the Arian controversy, which, I mean, if you read his church history and you see what's going on, what happened, uh, that was like the leading theology. I mean, obviously that's like our, our modern day Jehovah's Witnesses, but the Arians at this time... Uh, man, they had a lot of skin in the game, and they weren't they weren't backing down. And thanks to the resolve of a few key people like Irenaeus and Tertullian, um, the Arians were gone, right? But they still lingered. They still lingered. But anyways, the key things was about Jesus. About what do we say about him? About his essence. So so I, Nicaea came to the conclusion that the Son, the Logos, right, was of the same substance as the Father, Homo Usias. Right, whereas the Arians say he was homoi usios, that he was like the father. That's a no, no. The son is homo usios, right? Same substance as the father, and that was the the key teaching to establish the the doctrine of God, understanding of Father, Son, Spirit. Now the Spirit didn't have a big role yet, as far as theologically speaking. Uh, it was kind of a, it was kind of like already understood because the Father is the God is Spirit, so it wasn't truly hard to kind of contemplate that. But the key was. Because if you could figure out, if you could establish the deity of Christ and the Trinity, uh, by as far well, if you could establish that 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 Christ is God of God, light of light, right? That He is the same essence of the Father. Adding a third to it wouldn't be a problem. That's kind of what it kind of came down to. So, anyways, uh, good stuff to know. But so yeah, so again, the fathers are broken up by anti-Nicene and post-Nicene. Those that came after 
of the Council of Nicaea, the Nicaea period. So the first one we're going to get to is Justin Martyr. He was one of our apologists at this time. Uh, background about him. So he lived between 100 and 165 AD. He had Greek parents. He was born in Palestine near the modern city of Nablus in Samaria. He went to Ephesus and studied the philosophies of the time, especially Platonism, right? Because that was, again, they're in, that's the milieu they're in. That's right, the Hellenization going on. So, oh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Although deeply impressed by the death of Christian martyrs, he was actually converted, as he himself related, by a humble old Christian. For a while, he taught Christian philosophy at Ephesus, but left in 135 and went to Rome, where he taught and wrote, <coughs> excuse me, until he was martyred under Marcus Aurelius. So, <clears throat> excuse me, get into him a little more. So, just, just a martyr. A Greco-Samaritan provides an account of his pilgrimage through Stoic, peripatet, peripatetic, I can't even say that word, and Pythagorean instruction, which taught him nothing about God. So, that word, peripatetic, basically is synonymous with Aristotelianism, right? This, the word's primary use is about a teacher who works in different schools. So, it's actually a, a professional term. It is peripatetic. And I've never used that word, and I'm not going to use it again. Anyway, so that's what kind of like, so this is account is 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 his account of, of, of coming, right, his pilgrimage, becoming a believer. So, but his last stop before converting to Christianity landed in Platonism. The ideas and concepts of, of <clears throat> the ideas and concepts he derived from Platonism about um, transcendent ideas, incorporeal objects, right? He said now he finally had wings to his mind, as he writes. So in his recalling of a discussion, now this is a famous discussion, and you may have heard this before, maybe just in a theology class, maybe, right? So in his, in his recalling of a discussion he has with an old man, this old man asked him to give a definition of God, which Justin offers this custom response. He says, quote, that which is uniformly and consistently always the same and provides the cause of existence for all other beings. Now, the old man was a Christian and agreed with him, reflecting the common Christian philosophical theology of this time. However, knowing this God is of greater importance for the Christian. So, excuse me, Justin's view of God was very abstract and personal, right? I mean, he understood that he should be a being as always existed and gives existence to everything else. But the Christian said that knowing this God is of greater importance for the Christian. Knowing this God, not acknowledging, it was knowing. Now we talk about the issue of not knowing God, he's incomprehensible, which all the, the philosophers understood, right? That's why he was still considered abstract and impersonal. Said, How can you know that which is impossible to know? But this Christian says, knowing this God is of a greater importance. Now the old man's questioning Justin regarding his knowing of God shattered Justin's Platonism because a Platonic view could never bring a creature into a relation with the divine essence. Platonism allowed us to see the transcendent God from afar, though you can't see you can't see him, right? But this acknowledgement of that, but the Christian faith allows us to know this God. <clears throat> so Platonic philosophy, it did not lead one to faith in Christ. Rather, at this time it stimulated one's thinking of what is beyond uh, around us, right? It gave us a conceptual framework, which we've been talking about. But what was key to knowing God? Revelation. Revelation is what man needed to have this true knowledge of God and know him. However, two central concepts on the nature and being of God shared between the two views are, one, that God is immutable, uncreated, eternal, and perishable, and two, he is the ultimate cause of all that exists. He is the ground of being. Quote, God alone is unbegotten and incorruptible, but all other things after him are created and corruptible. God is the creator of all things and is superior to the things that are to be changed. Now, while the old man criticized Justin for religious knowledge of God, he was on common ground when it came to the nature and being of God. Now, Justin rejects little interpretations of biblical metaphors that depict God having arms, hands, feet, that kind of thing, right? God doesn't go up or come down or anything. Either when the Bible says, either when the Bible says God went up from Abraham, right, in Genesis, Genesis 18, 22, excuse me, <clears throat> or when God came down to look at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, 5, 11, 5 or when he shut the ark into, when he shut Noah into the ark, right? Justin didn't accept these things. 
And we should. We shouldn't say that God has hands and feet and arms, right? Justin knew that. But Justin writes, this is the reason why he rejected them. He says, The ineffable Father and Lord of all neither has come to any place, nor walks, nor sleeps, nor rises up, but remains in his own place, wherever that is, quick to behold and quick to hear, having neither eyes nor ears, but being of indescribable might. And he sees all things and knows all things, and none of us escapes his observation. And he is not moved or confined to a spot in the whole world, for he existed before the world was made. And lastly, Justin affirmed the sovereignty of God, in a sense, making it something that defines or gives credentials of true divinity. Now, this is an important thing. Now, when we think of the sovereignty of God now, right, we may think of the doctrine of grace, of Calvinism, right? Remember, this is not part of the issue, and, and that's why it's important to, to, to remember about context. You will have critics of Reformed classical orthodoxy that will say, well, this view of Calvinism didn't happen until Augustine came. It wasn't in the early church. But remember, dealing with divine sovereignty and human responsibility, right, that wasn't a problem until it came an issue in Augustine's time. So it doesn't mean the Bible doesn't teach it or that's not true, right? It wasn't a problem for the church until that time. What was the issue now was establishing the most important thing of Christian teaching, the triune God of the Bible, right? Being able to describe and talk about God in a coherent manner that accounts for monotheism, right? So supports monotheism, but yet rightly attributes the divinity of God to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So, so again, so but but here I, I make this point now because Justin affirmed it, right, as a credentialing piece. It was known that God has to be sovereign. If he is not sovereign, he is not true divinity. So here's his statement. He says, once he be once we become <clears throat> excuse me, whence we become more assured of all things he taught us, since whatever he beforehand foretold should come to pass is seen in fact coming to pass. And this is the work of God, to tell a thing before it happens, and as it was foretold, so to show it happening. Now we go back to Isaiah uh, 40 through 48, right? About God decreeing the things of the past and bringing them about, right? That he makes sure they happen. That is a credential of divinity and that's what justin is saying here right that belongs to the to the divine nature is to tell a thing before it happens and as it was foretold to show it happening so that's our 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 brief trip through um justin our next cat if you will is theophilus of antioch now little is known about him he died around 188 but he was the first commentator on the Gospels, the responsible and responsible for the science of chronology, and very importantly, was the first theologian to use the word triad of the Godhead. Um, I hopefully I, I included the word triad in, in my I forgot now, it's been so long since I wrote this. But anyway, so Theophilus of Antioch. So he's a bishop. Um, <clears throat> now he holds to a strict transcendental monotheism, stating that God's form is ineffable and inexpressible, right? So again, the same kind of language. Theophilus offers a litany of appellations regarding the nature of God, and here's a few. He says, God is incomparable in power, unfathomable in greatness, and unrivaled in wisdom. God doesn't have a beginning because he was never brought into existence, thus he is immutable. Now, one thing I didn't mention too, as I go through all these different fathers, I have everything footnoted as far as where you can find it at. So it's stuff that you hear and maybe you want to read it for yourself, let me know and I'll, and I'll send you those, those sections for my teachings or I can just tell you where to find it at. Because so as we get later on, um, again, I want to be directly coming from the text. I want to make sure you guys are hearing from their words, right? So you can really get a good understanding of what these guys are teaching. Okay. So teaching against the Platonic concept of the co-eternity of God and matter, right? That was a an issue called dualism, that God and matter were eternal. So he was really uh, going against that. Now, did you hear what I said? It was a Platonic concept, right? So here is proof that the early church fathers did not wholesale take in Greek philosophy, right? They were very critical, right? So as we see here, he was teaching against this concept. So he writes, if God is uncreated and matter uncreated, God is no longer according to the Platonists, the creator of all things. So he identifies an inconsistency in their philosophy, right? How can he be the creator of all things 
if matter is uncreated as well. All right. So, so again, so I'm going to, I already said it, but I'm saying it again. The, Theophilus was showing the inconsistency in the Platonic view that claims God is the creator of all things, yet they held that matter was eternal. But God is uncreated, thus unalterable. If matter were like God, right, then matter is uncreated and unalterable. But what do we know, right? Matter is alterable. It changes. Now, God's, God's, gosh, God's power is supreme in that he did not create out of existent materials, for what great thing is that? So the Theophilus. Rather, he manifests it by making whatever he pleases out of things that are not. Right? And because God is uncreated, he is not needy like the created. He stands in need of nothing. God's act of creating was through his own word, internal within his own bowels. Kind of an old sentence, right? But his innards, if you will. Right? So again, he's talking about coming from within him, right? So even though we see the word that it says he, he pleases he, or he makes things out of things that are not, right? Just a way of saying that there is nothing prior to God. There was no material, right? Basically, what exists at one time did not exist, and now it does solely through the work of God. So God's act of creating was through his own word, right? Logos, internal within his own bowels. He begat him, emitting him along with his own wisdom before all things. The word which we can also look at as the RK, the governing principle, being the Spirit of God, power of the highest, made the heavens and the earth to make himself known through his works. So when, when Genesis 1, 1 through 2 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth being without form, and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the water, this sacred scripture, Theophilus writes, teaches us at the outset to show that matter, from which God made and fashioned the world, was in some manner created, being produced by God. Now I would say that the that the language of Genesis one, it's it's the Father talking to the Son. So he says, "Let there be light," and the Son responds to the to the Father's command, and He creates light. And it's a beautiful image of looking at Father and Son creating together. So the matter used in the forming of the earth was first created by God, plain and simple. So in Theophilus, as we looked at here. We have a great example of philosophy being synthesized with scripture, with the sacred scripture having primacy in our doctrinal formulations. Now we're going to move on to Irenaeus. But actually, I'm already at 40 minutes, so I think I will save Irenaeus. But I'm going to make another lecture probably in a few weeks for you guys. So I'm going to stop there. i got to do some editing here. But um, I hope what you've been hearing is, is really exciting stuff to start to see these this 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 Christian philosophy, Christian doctrine being developed, right? And again, as you, as you see, I want you to also have this takeaway that again, they were critical, right? The early church was very critical because they wanted to safeguard the truth of who God is. They didn't want to just uh, be like the others, right? Why? And why is that? Because they were bound to scripture. They were bound to what the text said and declared about Christ, about God, about the spirit. And that's what gives, gave the church the, the confines, the the, the parameters of where we're to operate, that whatever we use to help support our teaching, it has to be consistent, right? And if, if we import a philosophy that takes away from what the scriptures teach, that philosophy, bam, is garbage. So anyways, gentlemen, if there's going to be ladies at some point listening to this and watching this, um, enjoy this time, and I will get to you next time. Bye.